All right, uh, welcome to another open team in-depth session. I'm excited to have uh, the Regen here, uh, team here today to give us an update on uh, some of, uh, I think this will be one of a few in-depths, uh, but this should give us a good overview and I'll turn it over to uh, Gregory and uh, his team. All right, uh, thanks Doran. Um, hello everyone. Um, yeah, really excited to be doing an in-depth um, today. Our first, as Dorn was saying, probably of, of several. Um, we're going to focus on kind of a broad overview of Region Network's um, mission, um, some of the technology that we're working with, um, a little bit about our go-to-market strategy and, you know, where and how we've received funding and, you know, how we're approaching governance because we feel like that all of that stuff is probably really useful context for everyone on the call. So, um, and then I think in subsequent in-depths, we'll get in deeper into some of the, you know, technical weeds about specific places where we're working that have intersections with uh, open team, be that science or um, governance or blockchain, whatever it might be. So this is going to be kind of a broad overview. Um, so with that, I will uh, start sharing my screen and kick it off. Um, Okay, so. Fantastic. I actually like keeping the little gallery view. It's nice to see some faces while I'm talking. <laughs> cool. So um, welcome to our open team deep dive. Um, so I wanted to start out with uh, kind of just an overview of Region Network's mission and some of the things that we believe are imperatives. And what I mean by imperatives is, you know, the systems that we're building simply won't work if these things aren't true. And so uh, our mission, um, Region Network empowers earth tenders with a platform that harmonizes agency to produce positive externalities between communities of outcome funders verifiers and earth stewards. The imperatives that we believe are essential for that to come true are imbuing the existing economy with ecological sentience, um, be data, understanding, knowledge, we, those, that information needs to be imbued into the fabric of the economy. Um, we all need to respect and up, uplift user agency um, with humane technology and tools. I missed an E on that, on typing humane. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, sort of as opposed to sort of like nudging or influencing or technology that sort of tends to try to get people to do something, we actually want to uplift the agency of users. Um, so tools and service to people growing capability and capacity. And then the last, the, the final imperative that we believe in um, and sort of shapes our approach to technology is democratizing control of technology in service to accountability, responsibility, and fairness. And I think you'll see throughout how uh, important we feel that is, um, especially as it comes to sort of agroecological data and, and what we're all working on together. So <clears throat> along with that comes a set of um, ethics um, first and foremost, we're dedicated to ecological regeneration. That's, that's the outcome we'd like to see. User sovereignty, data integrity and security, open source code, scientific integrity, and peer-to-peer -peer network governance are the things that we sort of underpin our approach. Um, so I thought it's useful for people to just get a sense of our funding um, to date and funding sources as we dive in. So we've um, gotten about $2 million through various sources over the last two years. Um, substantial portion of that is private investors in our uh, public blockchain staking token. Um, and then contract work for doing open source development, both uh, predominantly from the Interchain Foundation um, and also some from Open Team um, as well. So those are our main sources and so our sort of if you think about kind of fiduciary duty or whatnot responsibility around our public blockchain predominantly and then everything else we're doing which is all open source code and and all of our other uh money has come in to do open source development 
So that's kind of like where our, uh, what is demanded of us in terms of how, what is expected, I think, of us and what we're contractually obliged to do is all kind of aligned with this open source idea. Okay, so in, in service to just another, a little bit of understanding about where we see, you know, what business model we see emerging. Um, one is the, the token, the value of the, the governance token that governs this public blockchain we're, we're building. Um, the other is open source software and science development that serves um, our domain and our aims. Um, and the third is open source registry and credit marketplace. So that's sort of a go to market strategy where we're actually connecting with end users so they can purchase carbon offsets or, or whatnot. Uh, it's important to note we're doing all of that open source so people can clone our registry and our credits um, because what we're really trying to do is create a reference design there. But it's also important to sort of think that we're, we're also in a process of monetizing that and, and testing to see if we can create some market traction um, in that front. Okay. So um, as none of this probably won't be too new for most people, but we have three major communities that we're sort of at the intersection with. Um, Open Team, um, which you know, is interoperability focused um, between ag tech platforms and services. Um, Cosmos, which is about interoperability between blockchains. And, and as I noted, you know, a lot of our funding and contract work has come from, from that community and Cosmos as a community is 100% focused on um, the interoperability of public and private blockchains. And so that's, that's we, we're working on that all the time too. And then Open Climate, which is a movement, um, I'm excited to have some of our first calls between Open Team and Open Climate coming up, which is an open source uh, climate accounting um, initiative that is working to sort of create nested climate accounting systems in service to the Paris Climate Agreements um, between national, municipal, international uh, accounting systems, which is all kind of a big mess right now. And so these are kind of the three open source development communities that we're bridging and trying to serve in, in how we're um, proceeding. So I had mentioned kind of go to market, um, this open source credit registry with sort of custom white label credits and registry functionality. We're just about to publish um, a methodology around uh, grasslands, which we're really excited about. Um, we're just about to launch this sort of like reference application so people can um, actually like list and have a registry service to list and retire and exchange credits. We're really hopeful that what we're doing could be of service to um, the Ecosystem Service Marketplace Consortium and other folks. It's open source. We're kind of like out ahead of ourselves, but we're hopeful that what we're doing is generally very useful for many different people. Um, and it's really yeah, I've been inspired by our work here at Open Team, and um, and it's going to be iterative, so we'll keep improving that. Okay, so now I want to. I think some of the biggest questions, and and you know, we're sort of like we're bridging these different communities. I want to take a moment to talk about, and please excuse the amount of text in this presentation. <laughs> um, um, I want to take a moment to to sort of speak to um, the blockchain side of things and some of our thinking and our hypothesis around that. I think it's really useful, uh, probably for for everyone. So, um, we have a domain specific blockchain approach, and so I've sort of listed out different types of blockchains here, and I want to kind of do a quick run through of this. So, there are public kind of cryptocurrency blockchains like Bitcoin. And, um, you know, without getting into, you know, whether the energy consumption is problematic or, or any of those different things, it's just, it's just important to understand the tech technology behind that creates a distributed peer to peer um, accounting layer that everybody sort of has. And so there's no central authority that can control the, the shared ledger. And it, there's a lot of you know, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin being one of them, and that's one type of blockchain. There's another type of blockchain, which is a general purpose virtual machine where you can execute smart contracts. And they have like uh, Ethereum, for instance, has a Turing complete smart contracting language that it runs on. And that's sort of like, 
you know, th th their tagline is often like unstoppable applications. And what that means is that you put a bunch of arbitrary code up on a public network and it literally can't be stopped. Um, nobody can take it down. It can't be edited. It's sort of like immutable and deterministic. And it's just sort of a machine crunching along, you know, doing whatever it is that got programmed to do. Um, then there's private consortium chains where writing access or read access is limited, such as Hyperledger and the whole ecosystem of Hyperledger, which tends to be most popular amongst currently amongst the corporates, um, you know, governmental initiatives. Um, and then there's a new, um, there's sort of a new class, which is built to purpose proof of stake blockchains, where the permissions function and access is governed by either an open or closed set of users through governance tokens. And um, Tezos, the Cosmos Hub, Region Network itself, um, and others sort of represent this, where the, the stakeholders themselves get to define all of these parameters, what lives on and off chain, what, the, what applications can and can't run, you know, all of these different elements, right? So um, uh, that's where we're sitting, is this sort of highly energy efficient, um, um, flexible governance. It's not immutable, but it, it, you have to go through governance to change things. And so this is where you have sort of consensus and you can, um, yeah, decide what functionality is live and what isn't. Um, okay, so our hypothesis, sorry if this is a bit wordy, is that um, I'll sort of say as a, as a tidbit, state machine as the social coordination tool. And what I mean by state machine is essentially a stateful, a, a, a stateful um, like a blockchain that's maintaining its state. There, there's an a, account that's maintained, the network is maintaining its statefulness. So stateful, structured, and distributed database in service to the needs of a community with core functionality of time consensus. You know, the blockchain keeps track of time. That's a core part of knowing who said what, when, where. Durability of data, asset management, and trading, and then triple and a triple entry ledger. And, and then whatever the variety of auxiliary functionality are enormously effective tools for social coordination, commons management, and market mechanism design. In order for this to be true, blockchains actually need to be enormously easy to build, deploy, and manage so that users can essentially choose the one that makes the most sense for them, whether it's a governmental agency, a corporation, a multi-stakeholder watershed group, you should be able to easily choose the right technology and the right governance approach quickly and effectively at low cost. That, that's sort of a, a prime directive in the domain-specific blockchain hypothesis here. So um, therefore, our strategy is a, to build a public network that's custom built for the agroecological data needs and markets. Um, and in order to do that, we strongly believe that we need to make it so easy to fork the code and deploy alternative private or public networks that the governance of this network over time is always forced to optimize for the community and users' needs, right? This is sort of like an anti-monopoly. We wanted to make it so easy to leave and leave with your data and leave with your assets that the governance of these systems has to treat people, farmers, scientists, the users, you know, governmental agents, everybody who's using it well, right? And needs to be governed by that community, essentially. That's like a prerequisite. That's kind of a radical, crazy thing, but that's our approach. So we accomplished this by serving the Cosmos SDK meaning we're we're code owners at the Cosmos SDK. We're building general purpose tools for people to build blockchains for whatever they need, um, including ours. Um, and building Regen Ledger, our, our attempt here is to build something that suits the need of open team, open climate, and our own experience working in this field for, you know, 10 to 15 years. Most of folks in, in our team have been working um, on sort of ecosystem service and agricultural management for quite some time. Um, and then focusing on the governance token distribution to our ideal community of users, which newsflash is, is you all, you know, govern a self-governed system is really important. So just, just an overview of how we, this currently exists. 
We have R&D Inc., which is the, the business that's doing code and whatnot, it's building and gov um, governs 7.5% when things launch in July or August of the region ledger blockchain, independent token holders, um, 57.5, um, this sort of set of community um, stake, staking organizations, 30%, region foundation, 5%. Um, so that's just like a visual to sort of anchor the reality of what I just said. Um, apologies for being long-winded and lots of text. Um, excited for questions when we get to that. So um, this is sort of a verbal way. This is region network. This is sort of proof of stake governance 101. So region network is governed by token holders according to a 66% plus one voting system. That What that means is that if, if uh, more than, if 33% or more disagree with something, they can halt the chain and actually the blockchain stops and it stops being functional. Right, so there has to be a high degree of consensus in order to maintain usability, which means that these systems tend to be sort of conservative and you know, you need to find a functionality that meets the need of the users, which is why you want these to be governed by, you know, sort of specific groups. So there can be different blockchains that do different things that have small constituencies that govern them well. That's kind of part of this hypothesis. So as I noted, 35%, which is more than enough to stop the chain, is going to be held by community organizations that have demonstrated focus, capability, and a need, um, and need. And we're focusing on farmers, scientists, and developers for that distribution. Um, the other, uh, a, a portion of the rest is what's been sold to do fundraising, um, which are people who see the potential of this and are excited about participating. So uh, Region Network also aims to make it possible to govern smart contracts, um, including registry systems, credit classes, data commons, um, as nested systems, meaning there, there, there's one thing which is like the, the governance of the blockchain, but also that blockchain makes it possible, as you'll see a little bit later, to govern very specific things, data schemas, registries, standard systems, et cetera. And again, um, and yeah, so, so there's sort of like nested layers of that governance ability. So I'll talk very briefly about interoperability. Um, right now, there are hundreds of teams all around the world participating in the first inter-blockchain communication protocol um, testnet. Uh, we're one of them, which is sending packets of information, uh, digital tokens between many different blockchains all over the world and, and working out how all of that communication. Um, so that's sort of a pivotal part of making it possible for users to own their data and choose what community they sort of utilize for, for core services. Um, then there's sort of this idea as a blockchain of reg a blockchains as registries of registries. So what I mean by that is that you can kind of um, have a system where the blockchain sort of has a, a durable or, or immutable record of, of registry systems that, gets, that has to be amended all the time. So you can create backward compatibility um, without forcing everybody into a centralized standard, which is really exciting. Um, then there's sort of standards adherence, so picking best in class standards and sticking with them. And then there's standards generation, which is a big part of open team. Both of those are big parts of open team. In fact, I would say the, you know, in day-to-day -day conversation, these three, although we don't talk about blockchain so much, are all pretty common topics of conversation. Okay. So um, what is the core blockchain functionality? Um, I've done this sort of like, top pattern to detail, I'm going patterns to details. And I've talked about some of the soft, uh, you know, governance, community, funding, go to market, all of these different things. And we're funneling down here towards the end of this presentation and hopefully have lots of time for question and answer to really focus on the nitty gritty of our, our actual functionality. Like what are we building? What we'll be launching in a couple months? So um, our current hypothesis, again, centers around a governance first approach. Um, focuses on building tools that allow communities to design, develop, um, and signal trust. And in our case, we want to signal trust in ecological claims. 
digital assets and state claims. So um, this means the ability to have crypt cryptographically verifiable ecosystem service credits, right? And um, state claims, which are statements about truth, like there is a forest there or there was no, no till happened, um, asserted by some actor at some point in time. Those are really the two core functions we're shooting for with Region Ledger. We want those things to be ubiquitously available to all of our partners. Digital assets that represent verifiable e ecosystem service credits and state claims about ecological state that are cryptographically secure. And I, I didn't include this, but our holy grail in this is actually to make programmable auditing of these two things possible and cheap. We can talk more about what that might mean and how we can accomplish that. So core functionality of region ledger and, and Corey, feel free to hop in at any point. Um, I'm just kind of trucking along here. So <clears throat> groups module is a multi-signature governance for holding assets, making state claims and signaling trust on on uh, on-chain on contracts. So there's a basic N of M voting capability. So um, M being the you know, total number of, of signatures and N being you can set the threshold. You, know, you could have two thirds, you could have 100%, you could have a third that, that vote on something and say that if, you know, when, when you all vote, this thing happens. So you can set up a function that says, for instance, you can only add um, an address that has the ability to approve a, an, you know, a carbon credit if two thirds of the people vote yes, right? Or, or it could be for funding. You can only receive funding from Open Team if you know, these six addresses all approve your proposal or all of these sorts of things you can sort of keep track of. And so there's a governance element. So um, you can also do things like whitelist, uh, you know, for instance, UN sanctioned carbon credits or ecosystem service marketplace san sanction methodologies or whatever it might be. There's, a, there's sort of a system to link into user accounts and their own native software interface, the ability to, to vote on something, have it represented on chain, and then use that in an API to interact with other people. So there's like this governance uh, element through our groups module. There's the credit module, which is based on non-fungible tokens, which means they're completely unique. And in this case, we've created fractional non-fungible tokens. Um, we can get into the technical details. This is the kind of thing that's gonna require its own deep dive, both of these, in fact, probably. Um, so this is a native Cosmos SDK module that satisfi satisfies a minimum set of requirements for ecosystem service credits. And we did a, a re re uh, request for comment out to everybody about this and we're continuing to um, sort of create a standard around these ecosystem service credits. Um, an issuer issues credits in batches called a credit vintage to a project. And these are sort of unique. Uh, and each credit vintage is linked to an off-chain state claim like your Optus data or, um, you know, whatever it might be, um, Repliculture did a, you know, a, a verification and, you know, bundled a PDF, whatever it might be, you know, you link to that containing the data and the methodology information. So there's a, so there's a credit and then it's, it's linked to the, the um, methodology and the data that supports the, the claim. And it contains an initial distribution list of how the credits from this vintage are distributed. So, you might distribute 100% to the land steward, or you might distribute 80% to the land steward and 20% to the project developer, et cetera, et cetera. So you, it, initially you can set the rules and there can be a distribution of those ecosystem service credits to the group of people responsible for bringing them into the world, essentially. So that's like the, the core function, minimum functionality around the credit module. Okay, taking a breath. Here's Cosmwasm, which we recently ran a um, testnet for, and we had uh, participants from RSI and PharmaOS participating. It was a lot of fun. Um, so this is a web contracting system. 
Um, so this is where we want to have a lot of flexibility so that ecological state claims aren't only constricted to just credits. And act actually, initially, we didn't really even, you know, I'm personally kind of skeptical of the credit-based model entirely. And so this is where we can start to have fun, where you can have escrow, you know, accounts and lending accounts and, and variety of different things linked to ecological state claims. So you can have a municipality that reduces taxes for farmers that, you know, fulfill some land use requirement instead of it just sort of being some, you know, carbon market thing. Um, so this creates the, the, the opportunity in for sort of secure, um, smart contract based ecological state claims and agreements between parties. Um, uh, as noted, this is all linked into kind of our governance framework. So you can create, you know, you can have multiple people who have control over a smart contract and, and keep it up. Um, Cosmosm allows us to define uh, allows for users to define custom smart contracts that can hold and transfer assets while representing ecological claims data. The long term vision here is to have um, ecosystem service credits be linked more directly to on chain data and uh, represented by Cosmosm smart contracts, which leads us to the ability to have uh, programmable auditing. So you could actually like run an audit of any of the assets that are represented um, using a machine, um, which makes auditing costs really low, which we feel in the long term radically transforms the quality and um, nature of ecosystem service marketplaces to be more geared towards the actual physical attributes, the ecological state attributes, instead of the um, bureaucratic kind of existing bureaucratic verification apparatus, which is quite opaque and expensive and complex. Um, quick run, run. I, I didn't want to leave out science, although most of this has focused on our blockchain stack and side of things. So we're doing some very significant and exciting things, mostly around remote sensing, but some significant methodology development. Here's just a quick screenshot of some um, direct measurement of soil organic carbon using Sentinel-2 data in New South Wales, Australia, um, and some land classification to prove it, whether an agroforestry system is monoculture or poly, uh, polyculture in cacao agroforestry systems in Ecuador. Um, these are two pilots that uh, both of which we're sort of working to hopefully bring inside of the open team context. And then we created, I um, need to circle back around with the Dagan guys, but a while ago, a long time ago, we created uh, this analysis ready data pipeline for um, Sentinel-2 data um, so that we could get digital signatures and sort of automate uh, auditing of ecological state claims from uh, satellite information. And, and we've talked about that with the Dagan guys as an aspiration a little bit. So this was a, just sort of like an, iner an early prototype dockerized attempt to get something. We did this back in August, I guess. Okay, so I'm gonna take a breath and stop my share and, um, and see if there's questions. I tried to make it, you know, uh, apologies for the like rapid sprint through very dense information. <laughs> but I wanted to leave lots of time for questions because it's dense enough and there's enough complexity that my guess is that by keeping it kind of live and answering questions, we'll get the most out of it together. Well, th thanks, Greg. And uh, feel free to, to jump in here. As always, I have lots of questions, but I'm, my hope here is also, again, that your questions here can help guide uh, follow-up presentations where we can go in a little bit more detail to, say, Cosmosm or some of the other areas that, uh, that uh, Greg mentioned. So um, uh, feel free to jump in. And I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, Philip Sheldrake has joined. So maybe I, I, I've been trying to get you both connected here to compare notes uh, here as well from Open Farming. So I'll just call call him out. Hi. 
thanks for inviting me, Don, uh, and great to meet you, Greg. Great to meet you, Philip. I, I, I guess um, from, from, I might have missed the first couple of slides, so forgive me. Um, I'd like to understand adoption. What do you think drives or will drive adoption? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, ease of use, mostly. Um, not to be flippant about it, but I think ease of use is, is, is big. I think we're trying, that's one of the reasons why, I mean, why we're investing lots of time and energy into open team and, um, and, and open climate is just building, making it super easy to, to use, um, easier than other alternatives and having the added, I think, so there's ease of use. And then there's also for super users, I believe that, you know, in a competition between layer one solutions, the one that gives you the most governance flexibility for people who are really looking to build integrity in their applications um, is the most attractive. It was for us. And so that, it's sort of easy, ease of use, usability, and um, ability to, to participate meaningfully in governance of the layer one and when I say layer one, to those of you who aren't uh, familiar with sort of the crypto blockchain speak, that would mean sort of the, the blockchain layer itself. Whatever your blockchain is, whether it's, you know, um, something built on the Cosmos SDK or, or Polkadot or Ethereum or Hyperledger, or whatever it is, the governance of that layer one for users, we, we feel like in the long term will <laughs> be very pivotal for adoption. Uh, and I, I'm not sure whether this was the objective, so this might be a, a, a bit of a grotty question. Uh, but what happens if the competition is to do nothing? Uh, are you setting out to compete against doing nothing? I, I'm not sure if I understand. <laughs> uh, so at, at, at the moment, um, obviously, uh, uh, region is not in the world, it's not, um, you hope it's gonna be in, in, in a few years time. Uh, and so it's not whether it's regen or competing approach X or competing approach Y or competing approach Z, it's the competition is the status quo, which is this sort of stuff does not happen. It is, it is, it, it doesn't happen. So that's, I just wondered if you have any mechanisms to, drive adoption versus the competition of people of coming on and doing nothing like this. Wow. Well, um, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we do have our own, like, like, so we are working on this platform approach, right, which we're hoping is, uh, is useful in as far as it, it actually enables at a, at a programmatic level, um, the creation of assets in a way that currently it's like you have to run your own infrastructure, be your own brand, like accrue your own kind of like cultural capital to be able to say, here's like, I'm a registry and here's like a carbon credit that I'm going to go around and find a bunch of buyers and think the world should trust and do my own methodology and la 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 la. la. Yet that's completely disconnected from another completely independent group that, that, that tries to do something similar. And so I think like we see value in lowering kind of and ha in lowering the barrier to entry to that kind of work and allowing a singular sort of interface for it. But where that doesn't pick up, this is why we are working on our own credit class and our own methodology. One, to try and kind of test through that whole use case so we can kind of be eating our own dog food, so to speak. But secondly, we see value in the credit that we are developing. We see there is something novel to that to that to the science being done there and um and and with that at the very least hope that that can drive some level of a of adoption as, as just kind of like an entry point into the system if by the time that we open up the platform the 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 the, the community hasn't quite come to meet that need if that makes sense and sorry i didn't introduce myself yeah my name's Corey. um for folks who haven't met me i know 
yeah, to, uh, to, uh, to some of you who, yeah, like Philip, like we haven't spoken before, but I'm the uh, product manager on the, on the blockchain side for Regen. So I, I'd like to actually dive, dive in here uh, for the open team perspective and maybe have uh, the Regen team, if you could both speak a little bit to uh, the point that Philip's brought up in terms of uh, this other use case that we're facing in terms of uh, creating, uh, you know, essentially uh, farmer uh, driven, uh, you know, conditional use contracts and creating trust and the, uh, the alternatives that we're facing in terms of the web 2.0 approach, in terms of uh, digital signatures and authentication and how uh, those problems uh, relate to some of the tools that you're developing and, you know, essentially the pathway between uh, those different approaches to uh, providing confidence and trust in, in uh, exchange of environmental data. Yeah, so great. So, I mean, I, I sort of, I'm, str I'm kind of strongly opinionated about this, so apologize, but I, I, I think if we take a web 2.0 approach, because it's easier to maybe build. Define, maybe define some of these terms as you're using them. For yeah, okay, so well, so Web 2, Web 2.0 has a sort of a specific, it has to do with sort of the social, the social web and platforms, um, you know, and there's a sort of an ecosystem of business models that are sort of ubiquitous in a Web 2.0 approach. And most of those business models have to do with, um, commercialization of users' data as the, as the driver of, um, so, so users essentially become the fuel of, of the commercial model in Web 2.0. Um, Web 3.0 is an attempt that's still nascent, that um, is an attempt to, and, and it's widely used in the crypto space, but not just, there's also other people, the semantic web, um, et cetera. So Web 3.0 is an attempt to have sort of user control over their own data um, be the pillar upon exchange data markets or commons or exchange and it has a different set of business models and it requires a different approach to identity um, to you know data structure and um, and in it and it transforms business models and so um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, let's see. So Philip's question, I mean, the, the reason why it caught me so sort of dumbfounded is I already see the demand. I don't see that, like, everyone is wanting, everybody is screaming about, uh, you know, breaches of data privacy. Farmers don't want to give their data. Everybody's coming up against, you know, how do we create new standards? We're, we're all bumping up against this sort of set of problems that in my perception are essentially like when you move from web at web 2.0 to a web 3.0 approach, most of those problems change. We have tech technological hurdles to accomplish, but we're not, yeah, we're, we, I, t yeah, I don't think we can build a model in which the, the most common economic transaction is extractive based on, you know, the users. And so um, that demands these sorts of pillars of, uh, that, that I think we're, try we're attempting to sort of build a, a uh, prototype of, essentially. So I, I don't know, Dorn, if that answers your question or if you'd like me to go into more detail in any particular way there or Corey if you have anything to add on maybe 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 it's it, maybe it's useful to do to, to actually like in a concrete way talk about the difference of approach in identity between a web 2.0 and a web 3.0 um, approach I don't know I, I have a question that that I was wondering if it's appropriate to insert right now perhaps cool. yeah um, one of the things that I would love to get a better handle of is how some of the concepts you have shared with us instantiate to the open team 
broader use case. So perhaps picking on a couple of different projects that you are familiar with, picking on a couple of the use cases that you know we've talked about at length in many of the different sessions so far. I'd love to just get some early ideas even from you guys about how you see some of this work instantiating. Um, it would help me ground myself in some of the, the work that you've been doing. Sure. Um, I think probably the most grounded, clear one, maybe I'll pass it over to Corey to talk about um, sort of both the Cosm Wasm work that was prototyped and then the work that it looks like it's coming down the pipeline with um, our Sci. Um, on digital signatures, et cetera? Yeah, I can, I can try and jump in here. So this wasn't covered in as, as much in detail in the presentation, but I think that Gregor and I have spoken about it a few times just on the, on the standing calls, um, that in the most recent kind of testnet that we ran, for which was a Cosmosm enabled testnet. So this was the first time in which Regen was kind of operating a live chain to try and test out some of the functionality for storing on-chain ecological state um, data or contracts. And in general, the way that I kind of read the open team like space is that most of the most of the of the projects within open team are are on the data side, right? They're on the, the, the side of information making claims about ecological state, as opposed to, although some of the open team projects do like move into this territory as well. Um, looking at credit issuance as a thing that like an open team project is, is focused on. So like my read is that like it's more on the data side and less on the credit issuance side. And so on the data side where we have started to prototype work and to, and to see what those interactions could look like is with the recent Cosmosm testnet um, that we ran. And what happened there was uh, both folks from our side and from Farm OS um, basically prototyped and built in functionality into their applications, the ability to, in some kind of admin panel on, um, on a far, farm OS like page where you're entering in some farm data, to also enter in the address of a smart contract. And it knows that that address of that smart contract is something that is expecting a forest coverage um, update function to be called. And then what we do is we store a private key on the farm OS servers that we then know collectively from the open team community is like an authentic farm OS server so that when an end user goes and goes into the farm OS panel and says let me put in this contract address and let me press the button that, that the, the changes that I'm making to the to log my data in farm OS I want to propagate to the regen ledger there is a smart contract on the other end that is listening for that update and so for us to test out that work um, I basically wrote a Rust smart contract, which was living on Cosmosm. So we had code that was able to store essentially that same state data of like the forest coverage percentage, which was the dummy variable that we chose to use for this exercise. And on the farm OS side, someone could log that and then kind of, as long as they had the contract address there, push a button and it would, and it would send that data across to the chain. And then what we have is basically we have living on the blockchain um, an assertion that we know that the public key corresponding to the farm OS server signed and made a claim that this data um, yeah, was updated in that way. And so there, there's a lot of like holes that could be poked at that from saying like, well, why do we trust the authenticity of the farm OS server? Shouldn't this be something that's coming from the end user? Or shouldn't there be some other way that we that we are trusting some person or some entity to make claims and how are we making those decisions? Yes, those are all things that we kind of need to flesh out. But I think to get to your point of like, what is, where are we today in terms of like concrete use cases and what have we ex been experimenting with? This is like, this is where we've tied that thread sort of end to end so far. Yeah. Um, does that, well, does that kind of- Corey, could I jump in question? and just maybe ask, since we have Greg and actually Ian, <laughs> Uh, cook on the call too that part of this you know these claims can uh, we have the potential and, and jump in here Greg or Corey if I'm wrong here but that we have these different we have in the case of PharmaOS, Land PKS and say Optus we have three different uh, potential ways to measure uh, ecological state right at the field level remote sensing and then the related practices 
you bring those mm -hmm. together, that provides a level of assurance that may be required to execute the contract. That's and, correct. And that's, so, that's exactly the idea is that you could set a threshold, the contract, whether it's a credit issuance like somebody just gets a badge that then they can use to go talk when they, you know, their, their uh, farm OS instance. Sorry, it looks like I broke up, but for instance, you could get a cryptographic badge out of a smart contract that, you know, assigns to your farm OS instance that, you know, these, that RSI, an RSI auditor and Optus and land PKS all agree something that, that, then that badge can serve when they're talking to the NRCS agent to pre-qualify them for, you know, um, some subsidy or something like that. That's the sort of, um, that's sort of where the rubber hits the road, I think, in a way. And I, I wonder, oh, does that, does that help it, Ankita? Because I was also going to give Greg Ostick maybe if he wanted to jump in to. Yeah, I was just going to throw in like a quick, just added thought. I mean, I think, if there was only two actors in the system, if there was only like PharmaOS and RSI, like in our case, then you could look at this and go like, well, this is, seems like a lot of overhead, right? To manage what is an individual like data transfer action, which we could probably use other tools to verify in some way, shape or form. And I think that that's true. Um, but the intent here is to have a like broad, diverse system where a lot of different software players and developers today and in the future can engage it. And I think when you want that kind of scale and flexibility, you're, you're basically outsourcing this function to someone else. Like that's the role that Regen plays. I think it's, a, it's really a scalability question. It's not like you can't do these things in the absence of it. It's just about, um, if we really want to scale it, let's set it up right. So well, that's, and, that's how I yeah. see it anyway. Uh, another way that, that, I, that I tend to think about this is like where there is value in the blockchain use case and like, like where just more broadly, I feel like the, the, the blockchain solution has actually kind of made sense is when it's talked about digital assets, right? Things that represent something that you want to be issued and transferred between people. So that's currency, that's tokens. And in our use case, honestly, that's really just credits. If we were just talking about like, like, so, so that's credits and that's having a centralized index where you know that there is a certain guaranteed amount of uptime because Certainly we could say like, well, PharmaOS should just expose an API and our site should expose an API and everyone should know what those are so that if people want to know the PharmaOS and our site data, they can just query those. The only thing different that the blockchain allows is when you put stuff in there, you're basically guaranteed that, it, that the data is not going to go away. And, and, and so where that's valuable, that's when it makes sense. And, and, and I also think that it really is, you know, let's not forget that there will be, whether it's incurred by Regen Network on behalf of other people or incurred by the, the, the end users directly, there are transaction fees like that correspond with actually committing data to the blockchain. And so, you know, it's not like everyone's going to want to serialize every single thing that they observe to the blockchain uh, necessarily if there's, if there's even a small transaction fee associated with it. But when those when that ecological state data is tied to some kind of financial asset or potentially tied to some sort of credit or financial asset somewhere down the line, that's when I think there's more of an argument for it. Yeah, and I think, more sense. you know, from our community, I want to bring this back to Ankita to, to follow up on her question, but, uh, you know, the, the research value is one of those values uh, in terms of having trusted data as we're doing uh, large scale metadata analysis. If we have, larger scale homogen you know uh structured data from diverse production systems and we have to quickly you know filter through the quality before we're doing the meta meta analysis so that's sort of um but i want to head, head it back to you and kita because i think you had a follow-up yeah i think um i i appreciate your you know the value of the blockchain and helping us try to deal with large-scale complex mm -hmm. transactions that is sort of it makes sense um, the two questions that I think I'm really trying to tease apart here is, you know, you stressed on the idea of, or you stressed on the notion of the work that you're doing being very domain specific. And that for me is always something that I get excited about because I think in ag, we do require domain specific solutions. Um, I haven't heard yet too much about exactly what sets apart 
your specific implementation to be more domain specific for agricultural use cases? Are there certain kinds of things that you're considering? Um, are there certain constraints that you're working with? Um, so that's the one piece of it. And then I think, and I, I'm asking them both together because I think they're related. The second is the usability in the domain, right? So you mentioned this idea of, you know, the interaction between an RCS agent and a, an auditor and the farmer and the scientist, and you have all these different players. Um, have you, uh, how, how does the current practice fit into all of this? And so, you know, and this goes back, I think, to even a point that Philip was making about adoption, right? So when you're thinking about the adoption of something like this in the agricultural domain, I think it would be really helpful to get a sense of how you see each of these different kinds of users being comfortable with engaging in this type of system and how this type of system actually eases the burden of, um, of verification, which right now, you know, verification is indeed a very bureaucratic process, but it is something that has been established and there's an entire system around it. And so it's, it's been institutionalized a little bit. And so it would just be helpful for me to get a sense of the, the domain specificity and the usability in the domain of your specific, um, of your specific solutions. That was a long version of what was supposed to be a shorter question, I swear. And, and it may be a great prompt for our upcoming in-depths to focus some, uh, some of those uh, around those cases. Um, just a quick note on five minute call. <laughs> so if you have, but, yeah. uh, um, maybe shouldn't have dropped that at the very No, end. no, 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 it's, <laughs> I think it's a great segue to the, the, the follow-up, but uh, you know, uh, yeah, Greg, Corey, uh, you, take a shot at that and then we'll, uh, um, and then we'll be at the top of the hour. Well, I mean, I, I want to hear Corey's answer to that. Um, I'd also like to hear, I mean, at some point, Aaron's answer to that, and I'll give my own answer to that really briefly. The, from my perspective, domain specificity, first and foremost, is who's governing the network. So there's a functionality piece with where you're choosing specific tools and and other things but in a blockchain um from my perspective you know a big part of it because a blockchain's you know um, functionality is directly limited to the people who govern the network right so you can't update a blockchain with a new smart contract or a new function without governance and so the, the first and foremost it's it's who's governing it and what's it for so that's you know, I know that that's not a satisfying answer to you, but I think it's it's an, it's true <laughs> and sort of important. So it's like whatever this community, if this community does choose to engage in some way with blockchain technology, whether it's region network or others, um, there will need to be sort of like user engagement with governance to assure that the functionality matches the use case. And it can't be, because it's a distributed uh, ledger and a decentralized governance model, which we believe is important for sort of the trust between parties in the long term to actually occur in the way that it needs to for this domain. It can't just be a centralized platform that's really good at, you know, human-centered design and gets people addicted to their services and pulls everybody in to their tool. <laughs> that's like it it's a little bit harder but it needs to sort of c come from us in a way and so that's that's the first way i know unsatisfactory way of answering that and then i i also think that there are some like specific ways that the technology like that you know our approach and learning from open team and designing for the specific user group is going to make region ledger way different from you know a, a blockchain that's doing arbitrary you know computing <laughs> for users or something like that so um yeah i can chime in very quickly on with my response to that great which is which is just that i mean cur currently as is in what we are planning for for our mainnet launch the only domain specific code that will be in our project is the ecosystem service credit module and to be really concrete about that, like we built, we basically have taken that approach and said like, okay, if we're designing a credit for, or a way for people to issue credits and, you know, like, and, and design credits themselves, but we want to make a customized module for that, what would it look like? And 
the, the one requirement that kind of came out of that, which I haven't seen in other blockchain projects, at least yet, is the ability to retire credits, right? To basically render a credit untradeable. And, and in our use case, that's essentially when you claim it as an offset, um, either for regulatory purposes or otherwise, like when you're claiming a credit as an, off as an offset, it renders that credit untradeable moving forward. And so that was, that was a concrete use case where we like to do something that was, okay, maybe there could be use cases outside of the ag context for it, but like we did that because it made sense for us and for the use case we were trying to satisfy. On the state side, we're actually going the other way. I'd love for there to be a lot of really clear, concrete um, requirements that say, all of the possible ways that we can think of doing um, managing ecological state on chain will all satisfy this very concrete type of use case and we can build out something more specific to that. But right now we're kind of going with what I think is also true of a lot of the open team strategy is like a kind of bubble up approach where it's like, okay, Cosmosm exists in the world, let's plug it into our chain and let's just get people starting to use it. And if it seems very clear that like, the way that everyone's wanting to use it to store state is like always one of three ways. And we can actually make that a bit more solidified, concrete and consistent in terms of what the API is for that. Then I'm all for us moving in that direction. But at this point on the, on the kind of, on the, on the, on the ecological state claiming side, um, yes, it, it looks, it looks very generic um, because, because it is today. And that's, yeah, that's the approach that we've, decided to take. Great. Well, with that, uh, I look forward to following up uh, with all of you to, to dive in a little bit more deeply because I think, uh, Ankita, that framing I think is, is really excellent for us to think about in the next phase because really that both on the governance side and then the design uh, side in terms of how we take this generalized sort of toolkit and apply it to our specific use cases, specific production systems, uh, you know, that's useful and in service of the community. So thank you all for joining and uh, look forward to seeing you all again on the next one. Thank you. Thanks.